If you would open with me in your Bibles, please, to the book of 1 John, chapter 2. We're going to read verses 15 through 18 in just a moment. Um, to give a little context as to why we're doing this, uh, about the turn of the year, the end of last year into the new year, uh, the Lord began to stir my heart with uh, a series of messages geared toward the youth, toward teenagers, specifically those who uh, are close to leaving home, going to school, making decisions ab ab about their future and, and things that are uh, you know, pivotal years where you're making decisions that are huge and that's where this sermon is coming from. So the rest of you get to listen in. When I found out the new generations was going to be here today, I thought this would be perfect uh, because we have uh, more teenagers that way that are present with us, uh, that are seeking God's wisdom and direction for their lives. And, and I hope and I pray that this sermon here today uh, stirs your heart, that it, it sticks with you. And I pray that there's something that's said, even if it's one word, uh, that will stick with you not only today, but for uh, 10 years from now, you'll be able to remember it and recall it and, and be thankful that you, you were here to hear these things today. And, and that's my prayer for you. Um, so we're going to talk about do not love the world, love God. Uh, we won't get to the second part of the sermon about do not fear the world, but fear God. We'll do that next week. So it says here in verse 15, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Well, to begin uh, this sermon, we have to do two things. We have to make two definitions. If we don't make these two definitions, uh, then, then we have no idea what John is talking about here in this text. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves is we have to ask the question, what does he mean by the world? If we're not to love the world, what is the world that he's talking about? Are we not to love creation? Are we not to love our neighbors? Are we not to love other people? Uh, how does he mean the world in this, in this context? How is he using that word world? And I think the best way to help us understand it is by considering other texts of Scripture that also use this same word and understand how it is that they're using the word world. The first one that always comes to mind, and it's one of my favorite passages in the Bible, it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So there's this good, there's this acceptable, and there's this perfect will of God. And in order to get to it, you have to force yourself not to be conformed to this world. And the, the idea of conformity there is, is the idea of a mold or a press where the world is working on us to press us into its own image, to think like the world, have the desires of the world, to act like the world, to live like the world. And so the idea of the world there is the idea of this world system. There's this world system that, that is the sum total of the beliefs, the ideas, the thinking, the attitudes that we see from unregenerate people around the world. And the Bible teaches us that this world system that's in play that we're not to conform to is governed by Satan. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, he says that Satan is the god of this world, the world system. Not the world as in the creation, the earth, or people, but he's the god of this world system. He's the one that's manipulating it, influencing it. He's, he, the Bible tells us, for example, uh, uh, if Ephesians 2 verse 2, uh, Paul tells us that which we once walked according to the course of this world. 
according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. So Paul says there's a course of this world. There's a, there's a trajectory that this world is on. And, and everybody, everybody that is not in Christ is walking according to the course of this world. And he says the course of this world is being operated by the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. And what's amazing about that, I, I find it amazing, is that the world thinks that, you know, especially here in America, we're libertines, we're free, we're independent, autonomous creatures. And we do whatever we want, whenever we want, however we want. And Paul says, no, that is not the case. He says the entire world is walking in a certain path, a certain course, and it's being dictated to them by the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. He says the whole world is walking lockstep with with the devil under his influence. And John even says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, he says, The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The entire world system is under the sway of the devil and manipulating things. And so that is what uh, John means here by us. Uh, and not loving the world. He's talking about the world system, the way the world does things, uh, the, the, the ideas, the philosophies, the beliefs, the attitudes, uh, all the things that drive this world. He says, that's what you're not to love. Don't love the world system. And then he goes a, a step further, because here's, here's the second thing we have to define, is we have to ask ourselves the question, well, then what does it mean to love the world? Uh, we know what the world is, but we're not to love the world. Well, well, how would I know if I'm loving the world if I don't know what loving the world means? And, and so he explains for us in verse 16 what exactly he means when he says not loving the world or do not love the world or the things in the world. Because verse 16 is going to tell us the things that are in the world. And he says the things that are in the world are three things. There's three desires. Three desires that are in the world. And he says these three desires, in other words, when we talk about worldliness or what it means to love the world, we're talking about a set of desires, not a set of behaviors. Most of us, we, we think of worldliness as a set of behaviors, a set of do's and don'ts. John says it's a set of desires. And he says these desires are threefold. There's three desires. He says for all that is in the world, number one, the lust of the flesh... Number two, the lust of the eyes. And number three, the pride of life is not of the Father. Literally not from the Father, but is of the world or from the world. So these three things, these three desires are from the world. These three desires are not from the Father. So the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. For just a quick summary of what each of these are, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul gives us a summary of the, the lusts of the flesh or the works of the flesh. Uh, and he says this, I'm just going to read it for you. Uh, Galatians 5 verses 19 through 21. And I love how he starts, he says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. I mean, it's, it's obvious. It's all around you. Just look around. You want to see the works of the flesh. It's obvious which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. These are all physical things. But then you're going to notice how it's going to change and he's going to start to deal with attitudes, uh, attitudes of the heart. And he starts to talk about idolatry, sorcery. Listen to this. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So when, when John's talking about the lusts of the flesh, that's what he's referring to. All of these things that are associated with, with what we see in the world around us on a regular basis. And it's not just external sins. Again, it, it deals with attitudes and um, 
uh, you know, strife and envy and jealousy and outbursts of wrath and all of these different things. So he says, that's, that's the lust of the flesh. That's from the world. The lust of the eyes. Now, this is huge, uh, especially in our culture. Uh, you know, if, you, if you've been around for the last few years, the lust of the eyes is a huge thing in our culture. Um, the scripture that comes to mind for this is Proverbs 27, verse 20, uh, where it says that hell and destruction are never full. Then he goes on from there and he says, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. Think about that. The eyes of man are never satisfied. Right? Whatever we see, we got to have it. Whatever we see, we, we need to experience it. Whatever we see, we, we want to do it. And, 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 you know, like social media is probably the biggest purveyor of the lust of the eyes because you have influencers that are projecting to us through the median of media, the lust of the eyes, this is what a perfect body looks like, this is what a, uh, a perfect uh, relationship looks like, this is what a perfect diet looks like, this is what a perfect lifestyle looks like, and they're portraying all of this imagery to us, getting us to lust and desire, oh, I, I gotta have that, oh, they went there, I've gotta go there, they bought that, I, I've gotta buy that, they, 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 they have what kind of clothes? Oh, Oh, I need to go get that, and and it's it's this this it's this driving uh, that that you could have been the most content person in your life, and all of a sudden you open your eyes and you look and you see something and like, boy, I got to get me one of those, you know, yeah, I got enough guns in the closet, but I need to get one more gun, you know, that that type of mentality that you know I I they went to to to. to you know, Jamaica, I got to get to Jamaica. I got to go do this. And it's just this idea of this feeding frenzy of, boy, that's, that's, that's something else I've got to do. They're never satisfied. And it's, it's always this angst on the inside of a person wanting more, desiring more. And it's always this. It's always this. It's desiring what you don't have. The, the lust of the eyes, I don't know why we're getting into this, but the lust of the eyes is really about covetousness and greed. It's about you wanting another man's wife. It's about you wanting another person other than your spouse. That's lust of the eyes. It's about wanting something that belongs to somebody else. It's not yours. Covetousness and theft go hand in hand, right? And, and, and there's this idea within the lust of the eyes that I, I'm going to go after something that doesn't belong to me. It belongs to another man. Their land, their possessions, their spouse, whatever the situation is. And you're going after that. Where you want that, right? It, Jesus talked about the lust of the eyes. He said, if you look after a woman to lust after, you've already committed adultery in your heart, right? What's he saying? It began with what? Looking. Lust of the eyes. And that's, that's exactly what John is talking about here, is this lust of the eyes. And he says, number three, the, the third thing is, he says, the pride of life. Uh, the pride of life here, this phrase uh, comes from two Greek words. And, and the first word means pride. <laughs> it means arrogance, conceitedness. Uh, and the second word, life there, it's talking about uh, external life or life external. Uh, one of the word, studies, uh, word study resources that I have said... Uh, uh, life of appearance, uh, how you appear to other people. So let's talk about your external life. So, so pride of life is really a general pride. It's uh, pride of heritage, pride of family name, uh, pride of, of who you are, pride of your accomplishments, pride of your achievements, pride of your success, uh, pride of, uh, of wealth or possessions or, uh, you know, where you grew up or where you live or you know, your bloodline or whatever it is, national pride, ethnic pride, right? All of these things that we see today in the world around us in maximum is this pride of life. Uh, and I, I think 
Right? He says that these things are not from the Father. These things are from where? The world. The world. And, and who's, who's orchestrating the world? And we're talking about the world system, who the devil is. And, and, and so this is coming not from the Father. These things are coming from the world. And I think the best way, because we, we don't have a time to do a whole sermon on pride and humility, so I'm just going to use one example, because he's the best example I can think of, and that's Jesus. He's born in Bethlehem, small, in a stable, right, with animals. His first bed is a feeding trough. Would you put any of your kids, when they were born, in a feeding trough? Probably not. In a feeding trough. He was born to poor young parents. They were probably teenagers. And they're poor. They're just starting out. I mean, Jesus is their first child. They're not even proven parents. And, and, and they're, they're parenting the, the Son of God. And, and, and Jesus grows up not uh, in the classroom. He, he grows up the son of a carpenter and, 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 and learning to build things, not, not learning in, in higher education. And, and then when Jesus, uh, at the age of 30, goes to be baptized in the Jordan by John and the Spirit comes upon him and he begins his ministry, he goes out and he chooses his 12 disciples. And you know what's fascinating? Jesus didn't go to the local seminary and pick out the 12 best Pharisee students or the local Sadducee seminary and pick out the 12 best Sadducee seminarians. He didn't go to the Sanhedrin and pick out the 12 best leaders of Israel who would have been Pharisees as well. He didn't go and do that. He went and he picked guys that are like us. Fishermen. What do fishermen know about preaching? What do, what do fishermen know about the ministry? What, what do fishermen know about ministering to lost souls? What, what do they know about anything like that? Right, he, he picks out tax collectors. I mean, tax collectors don't exactly have a good reputation. Uh, probably not today either, but especially not back then. Right? And he picks out these people for your 12. And, and even uh, there's an incident, for example, in Acts 4 when uh, it's Peter and John are called before the Sanhedrin to testify. And, and it says there in Acts 4.13 that they perceived that they were untrained and uneducated men. Peter and John, you're, you're two, two of your best apostles and they could tell, this is post-resurrection, post-ascension, the Holy Spirit's been poured out. And they're like, these guys are a bunch of uneducated and unskilled men. But then it goes on and it says, but they knew that they had been with Jesus. Right? That's the difference. They may have been unskilled and untrained, but they'd been with Jesus. They knew Jesus. Right, but that, that goes against the grain. That goes against our thinking that, that why would you pick them? And, and of course, we're told in Scripture, right, that even salvifically, uh, we're told, uh, what is it, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27, 28, that, that there's not many, that God doesn't call many people that are wise or noble. Instead, He calls the foolish he calls those who are weak, and He calls those who are base. He calls those who are despised. Say, so, so what are you doing here? Well, I'm, I'm the despised. I'm the, the fool. I'm the, I'm, the, I'm, the despised. I'm the base one that He calls. That's what any of us are doing here. It's, it's not because of our position that He called us. It's, it's the lack of our position that He called us. And then you get into Jesus' ministry, and... What does Jesus teach? He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the word poor there is talking about absolute bankrupt, like destitute. He says, You're people that are blessed because you realize you're broke. You have nothing. You offer nothing to God. You have got nothing to give God. You have nothing to offer Him, and therefore yours is the kingdom of heaven. It's not the person that thinks they have it together and they have everything that theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's the person that is bankrupt and they know they're bankrupt and they need help, and that's the one that God says, that's, The kingdom of heaven is yours. And he says, Blessed are the meek. 
for they shall inherit the earth. Not blessed are the proud, for they'll inherit the earth, but blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And, and, then, and then Jesus, uh, in his self-description of himself, he says, Come on, take my yoke upon you and learn from me from what? Meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. What kind of person was Jesus? Proud, arrogant, conceited? No, Jesus was meek and lowly. Meek and lowly. Two things that don't go together. Jesus and pride. Two things that don't go together. Christians and pride. There's no such thing as a proud Christian any more than there is the, such a thing as a proud Jesus. Jesus, even in his death, it says, uh, Philippians 2.8, um, that he was found in the appearance of a man and that he humbled himself to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So that even at his death, he humbled himself to the most excruciating, horrific death known to mankind at that time, the death of the cross. That is our Savior. The thing I love about Jesus, you know what I love about Him? Jesus could care less about where you went to school, what job you have, how much money you make, what, you know, how wealthy you are, what your position is, what your title is, what your rank is, what your family name is. None of that stuff impresses Him. My wristwatch ain't going to impress Him. My clothes ain't going to impress Him. All that Jesus cared about is souls, people, the person, not the stuff, not the externals, not the pride of life, but he cared about the individual. He, he was concerned about souls and where they were going to be eternally and healing sick bodies and curing demoniacs by setting them free from demon possession. And that's what he was concerned about. You know, that's why, that's why sinners gravitated to Jesus and not Pharisees. Because if you're in the pride of life, there's this idea that I'm somehow better than you, that, that what I have is better than you, and who I know is better than you. And, and, and that is repulsive to sinners. People don't want to be around people that think they're better than other people. And then you have Jesus, who is perfection personified, who never sins, who's perfectly holy, and he doesn't think he's better than anyone. People are gravitating to that characteristic in Christ that this man actually cares about me and he cares about my soul and where I'm going to spend eternity. He doesn't care about all the stuff I have and all the people I know and my position and title. He wasn't, he wasn't impressed by Nicodemus, who was the ruler of the Pharisees, the, the, the head of the Sanhedrin. He wasn't impressed by Nicodemus. He told Nicodemus, look, buddy, you need to be born again. You're not saved. Do you think you're the teacher of Israel? You don't even know what it means to be born again. That's my Jesus. That's your Jesus. That's our Jesus. Not this proud, arrogant, conceited individual, but this meek, lowly, humble individual that when you're wounded and you're broken and you're hurting, you can come to Him and He's concerned. He'll heal you. He'll deliver you. He'll set you free. He'll forgive you of your sins. So what does it mean to love the world? What is the love of the world? The love of the world is when we live our lives according to the desires that come from the world. If I live my life according to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, then I am loving the world. We're halfway through verse 15. <laughs> I guess you don't see my sense of humor in that. <laughs> don't worry, we won't hold you too long. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Notice this statement here. This, this is, this is, there's such pristine, clear, concise truth that you'll find in Scripture that it's hard to find anywhere else. 
We, we love this gray area. Nothing's black and white anymore. There's no actual truth and lie. It's just your opinion, your idea, your perspective, your beliefs, your view. And John makes this clarion call. He says this. He says, if anyone loves the world, what is true? The love of the Father is not in him. In other words, if you love the world, guess what? You don't love God. Now, we don't, we don't think that way. We, do, we, don't, we, don't, we don't walk in that realm. We don't think that way. We, we just, yeah, I love the world. I love God. It's all the same to me. And, and John says, no, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Literally, the love for the Father is not in him. You think that's, that's harsh, cruel. Uh, you know who else taught this? Jesus did. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, he says, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. No one can serve God and mammon. Mammon meaning wealth. What his point is and what Jesus' point is is simply this. You can't have two loves in your life. You can love God or you can love the world, but you can't love God and the world at the same time because we have found out already the world system is diametrically opposed to God and it's at the behest or under the authority of Satan who is the prince of the power of the air that's, that's working that course of the world a certain way. And so we can't love the world which is adverse to God and then come around and say we love God. I love God... But, but I still love the world. And what does it mean to love the world again? To walk in the same desires, the flesh, the eyes, the pride of life. That's what it means to love the world. Now in closing, we're going to take up verse 17. And then I'm going to make my, my final and my main point. And, and I hope that everyone will uh, listen to this. He says, and the world... He is passing away in the lust of it. So he, he puts this uh, note about the world and, and the truth about it is that it's transitory. Uh, everything, uh, listen to me, the life as we know it right now on planet earth will not always be like this. Right, um, Jesus taught very emphatically that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. We don't realize it, but this world is already, it's in the present tense, right? And, and, and the world is, is, present tense, passing away. It's already in a state of decay. It's already in a state of decline. And it's, it's, it's heading to a place where, you know, uh, if we were to get into verse 18, we, we won't have time for that today. But, but John refers to this as the last hour. Uh, Peter calls it the last days. Uh, the, 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 the imagery that he's using is this idea that the earth, the world as we know it, is on a uh, timer. And that timer is not winding up, it's winding down. We're in the last hour, we're in the, the last days, we're in the, the last time period in redemptive history before the second coming of Christ. And when the second coming of Christ occurs, life on this planet is going to come to a screeching halt and it's going to be radically different under the kingdom of Christ on this earth. So he says, this world's passing away and the lusts in it are passing away. Who invests their life in a thing that's passing away? You don't invest in a company that's going bankrupt. You don't, you don't invest in something that's not, that doesn't have a future. And that's his, 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 his appeal to us is this world and all of the things in it, it's all passing away. And yet we devote so much of our time, attention, energy, and love into this world. And he says, it's all for nothing. This whole world is coming to a culmination. It's coming to a, hand, to a head. We are in the last days. We're in the last hour. It's, it's tick, 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 tick. Christ is coming. And when he comes, life as we know it is going to come to a screeching halt. And a whole new order of things will be implemented under the King, the Christ.
But notice this, this is our closing statement here, the last half of verse 17. But, all right, so contrast. Let, let, me, let me say it a little bit more boldly. If you love Sodom, you're not heading to safety. If you love the world, you're not going to be saved from it. You're going to perish with it. Then he, then he says, but... Now listen to this. This is profound. And, and this is what I hope that you get today. If you don't get anything else, that you listen to this last five minutes or whatever. And, and get this much. But he who does the will of God abides forever. He who does. I want you to think about those words. He who does the will of God abides for what? Forever. Now see, he's, he's contrasting. You do not love the world. Love God. Loving God is not just simply saying, I love God. It's not, come on, hear me. It's not just a confession. I love God. Not loving the world, but loving the Father, loving God is also with that love, this affection, this desire, is this doing of His will. The opposite of loving the world is not just loving the Father, it's doing His will. And He who does His will abides forever. I'm going to give you some other scriptures real quick. I'm going to mess with your mind for just a moment, but you, your mind needs messing with. 1 John chapter 5, in verse 3, John says, For this is the love of God. What's the love of God, John? That we keep His commandments. So, somebody says they love God. John comes along and says, this is the love of God. I'll tell you what the love of God is. The love of God is that we keep His commandments, right? I knows if you're in love with somebody... Okay, okay. If you're married and, and, and you met that woman that you're married to now... Uh, you would have done anything to marry that woman, right? You, you, you know, if you loved her, you would keep her commandments, right? You catch my meaning, right? It's not hard for us to imagine that who you love, you want to do what is pleasing to that person you love. Is it really love if you don't want to please them or you don't care what they think? So he says, yeah, this is love. That, that, this is the love of God that, that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. Uh, earlier in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, Now by this we know that we know Him. How? If we keep His commandments. He who says, so this is a professor, this is a confessor. He who says, I know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in Him. Do you, hear, do you hear this radical truth that he's preaching, that this clarion call that you can say all you want that you know God, but if you don't keep his commandments, you don't really know him. You can say all you want that you love God, but if you don't keep his commandments, that's not the love of God. Uh, you can say you love him all you want, but if you're loving the world and you're not doing his will, you don't really love him. You know, we, we could go through, and, and we did this previously in, in our church, you know, 1 John 1, 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth, right? This person is saying one thing but doing another. If we say that we have no sin, verse 8, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. Verse 9 of chapter 2, he who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. Now, right? What, what is he getting at? And this is my question and my, my closing question, my closing thoughts right here. The question is this, how does loving God and doing His will relate to saving faith? How does this love for God and keeping His commandments, doing His will, how does this relate to saving faith? I mean, how come Paul, in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22, says, If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Well, 
Why wouldn't he say, if anyone doesn't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed? Why did he, why did he have to say, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed? And we, we could give other examples of this as well, right? Um, from scriptures, I'll give you another one real quickly. In James 2, verse 5, he says, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised, hear this, to those who love him? So what relationship does this love for God this love for others have to do with saving faith. And this is my point. If there is real saving faith, the person in whom there is real saving faith will love God. The person within whom there is real saving faith will do His will. What we have done in, in modern American evangelical, evangelicalism, and, and to some extent I'm glad, and in other ways I'm extremely concerned, is this, is we have, we've done well, this is what I'm glad about, we have done well in teaching people Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Everyone would agree with that, amen, right? Yes, I'm saved by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. It's not of works. I'm not going to boast because I've got nothing to boast in. It's all by Him. But we've taught that so much so that we have become... We, we have taken out... Let me back up. Let me say it this way. We have taken away... The work of the Holy Spirit in regenerating and giving new life or new birth or born again, taking out the heart of stone and giving a heart of flesh. And out of that regeneration, this faith comes that calls on the name of the Lord and is saved. And we've made this, this, this faith thing... Uh, uh, too robotic, too mechanical, too, you know, uh, check these boxes, say yes when we tell you to say yes, uh, say no when we tell you to say no, and then boom, you're saved. And there's no impact of the Holy Spirit and the Bible's idea of saving faith is that it is faith resulting in something. It's not empty faith, empty professions, empty confessions. It's not conversion where there is no conversion. It is faith resulting in something. The faith of Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 is verse 10. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. It leads to something. Faith leads to loving God. Faith leads to keeping His commandments. Faith leads to good works. It doesn't end at an empty profession, an empty confession. It is something that is supernatural that occurs in the heart that creates, hear me, a change of desires. And this is my closing thought right here. When we're born again and faith comes, there is a change of desire where the desires are not the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Now all of a sudden, instead of pride, the Christian desire is humility. The world's desire is unforgiveness, resentment, hatred. The Christian desire is forgiveness and mercy and grace. The, the world's desire is greed and selfishness, stinginess. The, the, the Christian desire is liberality and generosity and, and giving and being charitable. Uh, the, the desire of the world is for um, rebellion and I'm going to do it my way. I don't care what anybody else says. And the Christian desire is submissiveness and peacemaking. 
when you are born again, when you really believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a change of desire. Where we're no longer walking in the desires that come from this world. Listen, friends. I've been the darkness more than you want to know. More than you would want me to testify. I have been the darkness. I've been in the world, of the world, all world. And I'm going to tell you right now, it is not salvation to tell me that all I have to do is confess Jesus as Lord and I can never be different and I can never change and my desires have to remain the same and always obeying God is going to be a burden to me my whole life. That's not salvation in the Bible, the New Testament, the, the, the Jesus, the apostles don't teach that kind of salvation. That kind of salvation is foreign to the Bible. That, that kind of salvation is the salvation where the professor comes before Jesus and says, Lord, Lord, and Jesus professes back to them, I never knew you. So it was an empty profession. There's not that change of desire, that change of love, that change of motive. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would draw us to yourself, that you would cause our desires to be like your desires, to love what you love, to hate what you hate, to care for the things that are precious to you. Lord, to rid us of worldliness, of idols. And let us not be those that walk in the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, and just add Jesus to it. Let us be those that confess Jesus is Lord because we believe in the heart, and there's been this transformation of desire where our desires are now the desires of our Father. We thank you for these things. Help us, teach us, seal these things to our hearts and minds that we may recall them in times to come. In Jesus' name, amen.